I got some really good questions about present value, and I'm really glad you asked them because it shows that um, you understand or you're trying to understand what we're talking about here. Okay. Use the tables. I'm going to post the tables online. Okay. There's just going to be the two of them. Use those. Do not start Googling and using other tables. Okay, because depending on where you look, you might not be able to interpret them effectively. Okay, so I'll give you tables. Those are the ones you'll be using for the final exam. And use those anytime you see one of these problems. Okay, so we're on to chapter 11. Reporting and interpreting non-current liabilities. So the other example was current liabilities. These are non-current Okay, so what are bonds? So up till now, we've seen bank debt and notes payable. So bonds work very similarly, except bonds are issued as opposed to a note where it's between um, the buyer and seller of a piece of equipment or of a piece of land, or us in the bank. Bonds can be purchased by investors the same way shares can. Okay, it's still debt financing, but instead of being um, a one-to-one -one relationship, it's a one-to-many relationship. So the company might issue a million dollars worth of bonds and we could all go out and buy them. Usually they're issued in thousand dollar increments. So because bonds are debt, what are some advantages? Shareholders maintain control because bonds are debt, not equity. The cash payments to the debt holders are going to be the scheduled payments of interest and principal. Interest is tax deductible, which we like because we pay less tax. The impact on earnings is positive. Money can be borrowed at a low interest rate and reinvested at a higher interest rate. So that I don't really agree with, but disadvantages of bonds. Remember we talked about bankruptcy. Because interest and the debt repayment, the principal, are legal obligations, they must be paid back as scheduled or the creditors can force legal action. Same way the bank can. A single large payment is required at the maturity date. Negative impact on cash flow because interest and principal must be repaid in the future. So just to think of how the bond works from an investor's perspective, the investor gives ePhone some money and they say to ePhone, give me an interest payment every year. And then when the bond matures in 10 years, you owe me the entire principal amount. Okay, now it depends on the structure of the bond. Some bonds are structured such that, such that the principal is repaid every year or part of the principal is repaid every year along with interest. And sometimes it's structured as interest only, right? So they might pay us, if we invest $1,000 and they pay 5% interest, we get $50 per year for 10 years until the bond matures. And then ePhone owes us the $1,000 principal, okay? As an investor, debt gets paid before equity gets paid. From an investor's perspective, debt is a less risky way to give cash to a company and therefore earns a lower return than equity. So what does that mean? That means if we're gonna be uh, buying a bond of ePhone, we're entitled to that cash flow from interest and principal repayment before they're allowed to pay dividends to the shareholders. So if you have the choice between holding the bond or holding the shares, you might want to hold the bond because it's not as risky, right? The flip side is your potential for return is not as high. If you're the shareholder, you have the potential for your shares to double in value or triple in value, right? If you're a bondholder, you don't really have a ton of upside, it's called. Really, you're going to get your interest payments. You're going to earn your 5% slow and steady and then get your principal repaid at the end of the year or at, at the end of the um, bond maturity. So from an investor's perspective, debt is less risky and therefore earns a lower return. I'll go into the risk return trade-off soon. Now, so when I say it gets paid, that also means, let's say ePhone goes bankrupt. If you're the debt holder, you might get something. If you're the equity holder, you get nothing because it's highly unlikely that ePhone has enough assets at that point to cover all of its debt. And only once all its debts are covered would the equity holders get paid.
So here's an example of why um, debt is risky to the business and not as risky to an investor. Let's assume we borrow 10 grand at 5%, which is $500 per year of interest. Okay. Let's say our net income before interest payments this year was two grand. The bank or the bondholders get 500 bucks and the shareholders get 1500. Great, we did really well. Let's say we had a bad year and interest, uh, net income before interest was only $600. The bank or the bondholders still get their $500. They don't care that we had a bad year. We only get $100. Notice how in both these cases, the bank or the bondholders still got paid their interest. It was us as shareholders. Our return went from either $100 to $1,500. Right, big difference. Equity holders' returns are therefore more volatile. If, our, if this income number jumps around just a little bit, that can impact our return quite drastically. Debt holders' returns are more predictable and stable. So this is why you can buy a GIC, a Guaranteed Investment Certificate, which pays a very low rate of interest, 3% per year. So you can go to RBC and say, I want to put away $1,000 in a GIC because you're very risk averse. You don't like taking risk. You want to ensure that the $1,000 is for sure going to be there next year when you need it. And the bank says, sure, we'll give you this Guaranteed Investment Certificate guaranteed by the government. Um, super secure. The government in Canada is not going to go anywhere anytime soon. They can just print more money if they run out of it. So there's really no risk there. So you're not taking any risk. Why are you going to get a big reward, right? The alternative is if you want to earn more than 3% a year, you can invest in a risky stock, which might earn you 20%. This stock might increase by in value by 20%, or it might pay a really big dividend if it has a good year. Right? But it could also go bankrupt and you could get nothing from it. So notice the trade-off between risk and reward or return. As risk increases, so does your reward or your return. If you don't want to take risk, you're going to get a low return. If you want to take a lot of risk, you have the potential for a high return. So bonds, just like stocks, can be traded on an established exchange that provides liquidity as liquidity that provides liquidity to bondholders. So the same way if we hold shares of ephone, we want to be able to sell them to someone else or buy more right? They're not worth a lot to us if we can't ever sell them. Um, so we might go to the Toronto Stock Exchange to buy and sell shares of ePhone. Same goes for bonds. If there's a lot of people, a lot of investors who want to buy and sell bonds, that's called liquidity. That means it's very easy to find a buyer for your bond or to find a seller for the bond if you want to buy it. That makes it more valuable inherently. The cost of borrowing, meaning ePhone would have to pay a little bit less in interest because it's really easy to buy and sell its bonds. What's the risk? If you buy a bond that lasts for 10 years and there's no liquidity, meaning you cannot sell it, you are stuck with that thing for 10 years. Even if ePhone is um, alive and well for 10 years, you might decide five years from now that you need a new car or you want to buy a house or you need to pay tuition and you need the money. If there's no active market for your bond, how would you sell it? Would you go to your friends and say, do you guys want to buy this bond for me? That probably wouldn't work very well, right? So to you as an investor, you care about liquidity because it means you can exit your investment, not because ePhone is doing poorly, but because you want the cash for something else. Okay, so characteristics of bonds payable, they look very similar to notes. Okay. There is a issuance date and a maturity date. Notice how this is 10 years out. There's an interest rate. And there are these two dates. These are the dates on which the interest is paid to the investors. Meaning investors get paid 
June 30th and December 31st, or half, every half year, right? This is called the coupon. And then we have the face value. The face value is when the bond matures, this is how much um, the company will have to pay you. Okay. The reason it's called a coupon, interestingly enough, is because back in the day when you would buy a bond, it would, it would be a physical certificate and it would have coupons that you rip off and you take to the bank to cash them in on the stated date. It was a physical coupon. Now, of course, that doesn't happen, but that's where the term comes from. So you can think of if you hold this bond, every June 30th, you're going to get a deposit into your bank account. Okay. How much would you get? Are you going to get 10% every six months? No. Your, this interest rate is always stated annually. You're actually going to get 5%. 10% divided by 2. You're going to get 5% interest per year. So, and that interest is calculated with reference to the face value. So your coupon is equal to $1,000 times 5% equals $50 every six months. And then on January 1st, 2025, ePhone is going to pay you $1,000 or is going to pay the holder of the bond $1,000. These are just some examples, uh, more real life examples of how bonds work. You can see how there's a whole different range of types. You don't really need to know these. Okay. What's important to note is there are rankings, even amongst debt. Remember how I said debt comes be before equity in the capital structure. Debt gets paid first before e equity gets paid. Within debt, there's a further ranking. There's what's called senior debt. They get paid first, followed by subordinated debt. Senior debt receives preference over other creditors in the event of bankruptcy or default. Therefore, subordinated debt, subordinated just means below. Subordinated debt is therefore riskier than senior debt. That makes sense, right? If in the event of bankruptcy, you might not get paid because you're holding subordinated debt, you're going to demand a higher rate of interest. You don't need to worry about all these details. I mean, this is pretty advanced finance here, so... We're not that concerned with it. So the bond indenture is just the contract that contains all of this information. So it'll say the issuance date, the maturity date, the coupon payments, the face value. It will also include covenants designed to protect the creditors. Creditors are the people who loan money or the investors. What might a covenant be? The covenant might be you need to maintain a quick ratio greater than one. Or you cannot issue other bonds. Okay, they want to make sure that you're not taking on too much debt. There's a lot of different types of covenants. And a covenant is, is just a promise to do something or to not do something. There's positive and negative covenants but it's legally, contractually specified. Okay, at the bond issuance date, the investor buying the bond is gonna pay cash to the company issuing the bonds, and the company issuing the bonds is gonna pay this, he's gonna give this bond certificate. This is just the security, right? This is just a piece of paper and electronic something that Questrade holds or RBC holds in your name that says you are the legal holder of this bond. Bonds payable are long-term debt, right? That's because they often have long-term maturities, right? Like a 10-year maturity. Notice how the amount of cash that the investor gives to the company issuing bonds is called the issue price. Okay, that is different in many cases, than the face value. And we're going to get into that. So what do you get as the investor? Or what is that, um, what does the bond entitle you to? The bond entitles you to periodic interest payments 
right? Every six months you get that interest, also called the coupon. But you also get the principal payment at the end of the bond term, right? The face value. Okay, so the bond stated rate versus the market rate. So everything up till now should, this is supposed to be a little bit of a culmination of how you would assess risk and return, okay? So the stated rate, the stated interest rate, also called the coupon, represents the cash that the investor will receive and the cash that the company will pay each period. And that's based on the face value of the bond. So a $1,000 bond with a 6% coupon pays $60 in cash per year. The market rate of interest is the rate of interest that a rational investor requires for an investment of similar risk. Okay. So let's see what that means. So in the above example, let's think like a rational investor. What else can we buy? What else can we invest in that pays 6%? And is it riskier or less risky? And let's look at this risk return um, chart here. As risk increases, your expected return increases. Said another way, you, you can't be expected to earn a very high return with a very low amount of risk, right? Because that would put you here. You have to be on this line, right? Alternatively, why would you take a lot of risk? Okay, why would you be out here for very low return? So investors want the most amount of return with the least amount of risk. Right, that makes sense. So, government bonds are usually very low risk. You'll see elderly people, retirees, people who are very risk averse, they don't like taking risk, will invest in government bonds. Government bonds right now, you can get a 10-year Government of Canada bond for about 2%, meaning it'll pay you a 2% coupon per year. If you invest $1,000, you get 20 bucks a year. It's not very much, right? But it's low risk. You are almost virtually certain to get the interest payments on time and to get that principal in 10 years, right? If the Canadian government were offering a 6% rate of interest, okay, and this new technology startup, let's say the company issuing this bond is also offering 6% interest, you should always, and this is, I mean, there's really no argument here, you would always take the 6% uh, Government of Canada bond. Because what's your upside? You don't have any upside because you're the bondholder. You might want to invest in shares of the tech startup because it might be the next Uber, but it might go under. But if you don't share in the upside, right, because you're a bondholder, why on earth would you be willing to accept only 6% return? If you could go to the government in Canada and loan the, and, and get loan, um, get 6% interest for loaning the money, right? So the example I chose here is where you have the same interest rate and it really allows you to assess the risk return trade-off. The problem is this doesn't really happen in real life you might have the, a 6% rate of interest on a bond from a startup and the government of Canada is offering you 2%. So you now have to say, well, is that extra 4% a year really worth it? And so you might build up a curve for yourself and say, where do I lie on this line, right? If you can be above the curve, if you can get a higher return than the risk should pay you, that's a good investment. If you're below the curve, if you're taking on more risk for a lower return, if you're below this curve here, then you're not being compensated adequately. So we're not saying that you should never take risk. It's just that you should be compensated for that risk. Does that make sense? You might be perfectly willing to buy a bond of a, te of a risky tech startup. If it pays you 15%, you might say, you know what, it might go bankrupt, but 15%, that's a you're getting 150 bucks for every $1,000 you put in per year. You might say, you know what, that puts me 
you might say that return is up here, here, and that risk is here, and you're okay, you're on that line. Whereas the government in Canada bond is down here. Both of them are on your risk return line. It's just moving up and down the line, okay? So in this case, you would always take the government of Canada bond. So let's think if we're this tech startup, let's say we're ePhone, and we want to raise money by issuing bonds, and we say, everybody, we're going to give you a 6% rate of interest. Who is going to buy our bonds? Who's going to loan us money at 6%? No one. Right? No one wants it because we're not giving them enough. So to incentivize people to loan it money, the tech startup has to offer the higher rate of interest, maybe 15% to give you incentive money, to give you incentive to loan money to it. It's higher risk, but the, re but the reward is higher too. Now, this is a bit of a facetious example because startups don't usually have debt financing. It doesn't make sense. It's all equity usually. Because again, debt carries with it that burden to pay interest. Startups are usually cash flow negative. They use all their cash to invest in their, in their product, right? in their staff, in their R&D. So you don't want contractual obligations to pay interest in principle. But it's just an example. As risk increases, the potential for return increases. Okay. So how is the market rate of interest actually determined? So how would they have come up with 15%? Or how does the government of Canada come up with their 2% rate of interest or a 6% rate of interest? Well, it's effectively determined by millions of people and investors companies competing for cash. It's basically like a big auction. It's sort of like 100 people standing in a room and saying, I'll loan you money for 10%. And the investor walks away and you say, okay, 9%. And, and then they come, or 11%, uh, and then and they come back. Or if there's a ton of investors swarming you at 10%, you might say, I'm only going to pay 9%, right? Because you don't want to pay more interest than you have to. And investors want to receive the largest amount of interest possible. So there's that tension, right? If you have a million people competing in an open marketplace, you're going to get to these very specific rates, right? People buying and selling bonds or issuing bonds. Let's just recall time value of money. 100 grand invested today at 5% is worth 105 grand one year later and is worth 110 to 50 the year after that. Okay, the future value, therefore, the future value of 100 grand invested today is in two years is 110,250. This 5% is also called the discount rate. Okay, same as the interest rate. Okay, so remember how, in this example, the amount of cash an investor is willing to pay is the bond issue price. And that is not equal to the face value. And I'll show you why. So this here is the most complicated part of the entire course. So I'm glad you guys are here for it. The issue price of the bond, meaning the amount of cash paid by investor and received by company is the sum of the present value of the principal, which is the face value, a single payment, right? We make that $1,000 payment at the end of the uh, life of the bond, plus the present value of all of those interest payments, an annuity. Remember how the interest payments are, or the coupon is always the same, right? It's always our $50 every six months. So it's the same amount at the same period of time. So we can use the annuity formula. The sum of these two is the issue price of the bond. The interest rate used to compute the present value is the market interest rate, not the coupon rate. And I'll show you how that looks. The stated rate or the coupon is only used to compute the periodic interest payments. That's how much cash the company is actually going to pay in every six months when you have when it owes you interest. I'm not going to get into this right now because I actually want to show examples first. 
So this just goes back to exactly what I was saying before. Um, think back to comparing a Canadian government bond versus the risky startup bond. If the market said you should be earning a 15% rate of return on the risky startup bond, but it only pays 6%, you should not be willing to pay as much for it. So here's the practical problem. When a company issues a bond, it has to sort of pick a number. And it doesn't know exactly what the market is willing to accept, right? It takes quite a while for a company to issue a bond. It's a ton of legal work, lots of regulatory work, okay? The other thing is the risk profile of a company changes over time. Right? So they might issue bonds at 6%, and a year later, the company increases in risk. Maybe um, they lost their CFO, they're involved in, a, in, a, in an environmental scandal, uh, they're losing revenues. As an investor, you might say 6% is no longer enough. At the time, last year, 6% was enough. But now we need more. Okay? So what you'll find is the coupon of bonds is usually not equal to the market rate of interest required on those bonds. Okay. So if you're a savvy investor, okay, let's say the company has done all the paperwork. They say, here, we have these bonds, $100 face value, they pay 6% interest. If you're a savvy investor, and, and, and they say, you know what, it's too late, we can't go and change that rate of interest because it's all been regulatory, you know, it's all been signed, it's all been stamped, these pay 6%. You as an investor might say, you know what, instead of paying you $100 for those, I'm only going to give you 90 bucks. How does that sound? And so they might say, okay, well, no one else wants to buy these at 100 bucks, but we'll sell them at 90, which makes sense, right? Because you're not going to pay the full amount for these things because you're not being compensated. What you'll see actually happens is if you pay $90, your rate of return increases because you're earning, the coupon doesn't change. The coupon is still $6 a year, right? The coupon is still $100 times 6%, but you only paid $90 for it. What happened, and so these numbers aren't perfectly factual, but you might see that your rate of return increases to 15%, which is the market rate of interest. Okay? You as an investor are indifferent to paying $90 and receiving the 6% coupon plus the $100 face value at maturity. You're indifferent be between that option or paying $100 um, and earning, uh, or for a, for a different investment, earning, um, paying $100 and earning 15% per year. Because you actually earn the same rate of return overall. So we'll show you some examples. So this is called a 10% discount from face value. Okay, 90 versus 100. So that's a $10 difference over the $100 face value equals 10%. Discount. Alternatively, what if the startup was willing to pay 20%? You are st still a smart investor, and you say the risk of this is really only 15%. They're overcompensating you, right? So you're now willing to pay a little bit more for this. You might be willing to pay $110 for $100 of face value, which is a 10% premium. The price in cash that the investor is willing to pay for the bond effectively adjusts the investor's rate of return to equate the rate of return to the market rate of interest, regardless of what the coupon is. This is basically all of finance right here. This is like, this is finance 101. Because the coupon or the stated rate is fixed, you can't change that, the price of the, the, price of the bond has to be variable. Okay. So you can think of this also from a supply and demand perspective. Um, so generally speaking, where demand exceeds supply or supply falls, price rises, right? This is nothing, this is nothing new, right? Think of detached homes in Toronto. Low supply, high demand, price goes up. Where supply exceeds demand or demand falls, price falls, oil and gas over the last year or two, right? There's 
oversupply of oil and gas, there's more emphasis on renewables and therefore less demand for traditional fossil fuels. Therefore, the price of oil goes down. If you were to assume for a second that the supply of bonds is fixed, that leaves demand as the driver of price. The price being how much you'd be willing to pay for the bond. So what drives demand for bonds? The highest coupon bonds relative to their risk will have the greatest demand, which means that the price of these bonds will be higher. Said another way, if, uh, if a bond is not priced competitively, no one's going to buy it. And therefore, the seller will have to drop their price to incentivize someone to buy it. I'm actually going to skip this example first. No, you know, we'll, we'll do this one first. Bonds issued at par. So par means that the issue price is equivalent to the face value. Okay. This only occurs when, here, let's, let's read through this. January 1st, 2014, BNSF issues 100 grand in bonds. That's our face. Having a stated rate of 10% annually. That's our coupon. The bonds mature in 10 years and interest is paid semi-annually. The market rate is 10% annually. In this case, the coupon is equivalent to the market rate, meaning you are being appropriately compensated. You are being perfectly compensated for the risk you're taking, right? The market says you have an alternative of equivalent risk for 10%. So you're happy to buy this bond at a 10% coupon. So from the company's perspective, they're going to issue the bond, which is a liability for $100,000, and they're going to receive 100 grand of cash. What happens in six months, every, or every six months, to record the payment of interest, or the coupon? Debit, interest, expense, credit, cash. Right? They're actually sending you cash into your bank account every six months. And then upon maturity, they pay the full amount of the bond in 10 years. So they're going to pay you the face value. Right? So they debit the liability and credit the asset. Here's a different example. Also using BNSF, they issue 100 grand of bonds with a coupon of 10%, stated rate of 10%. The bonds have a 10-year maturity and interest is paid semi-annually. Nothing's changed except the market rate is now 12%. What does that mean? For a, a bond of equivalent risk, meaning maybe this company is riskier than you thought it was, you can go to their direct competitor who's just as risky and they're paying you 12% in coupon. So you would not buy this bond for 100 grand because you can get a bond that pays 12% for 100 grand. So this bond is issued at a discount. So this chart here sort of guides you as to if you're in a scenario of a stated rate, the stated rate of 10% being below the market rate, so 10% less than 12%, you are in this scenario of a discount. That means that the bond price will be below the par value of the bond. The par value is the face value is 100,000. This is called a bond discount. So let's see how this actually works in practice. But fundamentally, do you conceptually understand why you would not be willing to pay a full, the full 100,000 for this investment? for this bond. You could go to someone else with the same risk and buy a $100,000 bond that pays you 12% interest. As a rational investor, you should not be willing to accept only 10% interest. Okay. Remember, the issue price of the bond is composed of the present value of two items. First, the principal, which is the single amount, and second, the interest, which is an annuity. So let's first compute the present. So let's figure out what the issuance price of this bond will be. The first step will be to compute the present value of the principal. 
So another nuance here is interest is paid semi-annually. So why do you care when interest is actually paid to you? So let's think of two scenarios. One is you have your bank account with $1,000 in it. It pays you 10% interest annually. So on January 1st, you put in $1,000. At the end of the year, the bank gives you $100 of interest. Okay, at December 31st, your balance is $1,100. Okay. What if the bank instead paid you semi-annually? What if they paid you 50 bucks at June 30th and then 50 more bucks at December 31st? So you might say, well, you're indifferent. Okay, you're still at 1100 at the end of the year, but that's actually not the case. If the bank pays you interest on June 30th of $50, you now, out, you now earn interest on 1050 You earn interest on that interest. So for the next six, month, six months, you're actually earning $51 or $52 worth of interest. So your annual rate, even though it says it's 10%, you're actually earning a little bit more than 10%. You could take that $50 and go invest it in another bank account or go buy a bond or go do something with it. So what you have to do is because this is paid semi-annually, you're actually at a 6% semi-annual rate for 20 periods. Does that make sense? 10 years equals 20 semi-annual periods. we multiply by two. Except we're not getting 12% every six months. We're only getting 6%, right? So the I is 12% divided by two equals 6%. So that matters because it impacts our table. If you look up on your present value table, 10 years at 12%, it's different than 20 years at 6%. 20 years at 6%, or 20 periods rather than years, 20 periods is going to be a little bit more. So our market rate of interest is 6% per year, or 6% semi-annually. Okay. 20 periods. If you go to your table, and you know what, I'll pull it up now. Remember, we're just up here. 20 periods at 6% is 0.312. So that means that, let's go back to our slide here, or 0.3118, they're a little bit more specific. What they're saying is, if you invest $31,000 today, you'll have $100,000 in 10 years if you earn 12% paid semi-annually or 20 years with 6% paid annually. Said another way, you are indifferent to receiving $100,000 10 years from now, or $31,000 today. Or you can put 31 grand in a bank account today, and if it compounds at 12% semi-annually, after 10 years, you're gonna have $100,000. Notice how if we were to do 10 years, at 12%, percent 0.322. Notice how that is a little bit higher than 0.3118. It shouldn't be symmetrical. The reason it's a, it's a little bit higher is because of that semi-annual compounding. You get a little bit more interest every year, meaning you have to invest a little bit less today because it'll earn a little bit more interest. Right? If you had the choice, would you rather invest 31180 today or $32,000 today to have the same impact in 10 years? Well, you'd rather invest less money, right? You're actually earning a little bit more throughout the period. So we've just computed, you know, I'll say out of the uh, slideshow for now because we're going to go back to that table. We just computed that the present value of that face, when the company in 10 years pays us that 100 grand, that is worth to us 31,180 based on a 12% market rate paid semi-annually. Now the second component is the interest. That's the coupon. 
Now, the coupon is an annuity, right? It's not just one amount received at the end of the, of the 10 years. Every six months, we receive it. So how much are we receiving? Well, we're getting $5,000. Where did that $5,000 come from? The coupon is 10%, and the coupon is always calculated with reference to the face value. So we're getting paid $10,000 per year or $5,000 every six months. So let's go to our annuity factor, okay? If we go 20 periods at 6%, we're at 11.47, 11.47, okay? Times our coupon. That gives us the present value of the annuity of $57,000. That means you as an investor are indifferent between receiving a $57,000 payment today or receiving $5,000 every six months for the next 10 years at a 12% rate of interest, okay? So from an investor's perspective, you are going, what, what is this bond worth to you? How much cash will you eventually receive from it at a 12% rate of interest? You're gonna receive about $88,000 of, of cash, or the present value is 88530 Let me go back in the slideshow. So again, finance is very much about indifference, and it's between two alternatives, are you indifferent? Or between which two alternatives are you indifferent? And in this case, you as an investor say, if I invest $88,530 today in this bond, over the 10 year period, I'm receiving a 12% rate of return. It's a little lumpy, right? We're receiving some cash flows every six, month, six months and then a big payout at the end. But you are indifferent to receiving that stream of cash flows or just 12% of your original investment every year, right? You can work out the math in many different ways, but it all is condensed in that market rate of interest, market rate of return. Notice how the 88,000, the present value of the bond, this 88,000 is less than the face. So the bond is issued at a discount of 11,470. Because the bond rate, the coupon rate isn't competitive, they have to lower prices. They have to say, we're only paying 10%, but we'll issue it to you for only $88,000. Now, in fact, you are indifferent between buying this bond for $88,000 and buying a 12% coupon bond for $100,000. In the end, you are going to be in the same position. You will have, have achieved a 12% rate of return, which is the market rate. So, journal entry. Remember in the, in the case where the um, where the bond was issued at par, it was debit cash credit bond for $100,000, right? In this case, the investor is only gonna give us 88,530, right? The investor is only giving us this amount. And yet, in the future, in 10 years, we will have to pay them $100,000. The bond payable is $100,000. The difference is this contra liability account called a discount on bonds payable. And that offsets the value of the bond on the financial statements. So if you were to look on the financial statements on January 1st, after this bond was issued, you would see net bonds payable of 88,530. So here's where things get interesting. This discount will be amortized or depreciated over the 10 year life of the bonds. Okay. There's two methods of amortization used. We are only going to go over the effective interest method, which is the method uh, required under IFRS. So this here is just a statement of financial position. It's an excerpt. But notice how we have this bond payable, face value of 100,000, but we have this discount on it, 11,470. So let's see how this discount evolves over time.
I'm going to go back a couple slides after. Calculate the periodic discount amortization using the effective interest method. So, remember what I said, how you as an investor are indifferent to, um, to investing 88000 today to earn your 12% return on this bond or investing $100,000 on a different bond, okay? From the company's perspective, their interest expense is actually the current carrying value of the bond, 88,530, times 12% per year. But because we pay coupon semi-annually, it's only half that, it's 6%. So if you take 88,530 times 6%, you get to 5312. This is actually the amount of interest expense that the company will record on their books. Now, remember the cash leaving the door is not 5312. We're actually only giving five grand in cash. That's what's legally stipulated in the coupon. The difference is the amortization of that discount. So let me show you an example to see how this looks. So here we book this journal entry, okay? Cash out the door, 5,000. Interest expense, 5312. The difference is just that we're crediting the discount on the bond payable. Notice how the bonds payable, the discount on bonds payable was a debit. We actually bring that down a little bit. Every coupon, the discount on the bond payable amortizes just a little bit. And you'll notice here that as the discount is amortized, the carrying amount of the bond increases. Okay. Now our dis the face value hasn't changed. The discount is only 11,158. And now the carrying value of the bond is up to 88,842. This is after the first payment. Every time we make this coupon payment, the discount is gonna amortize a little bit more, and eventually, the bond discount will be zero, and the face value of the bond will be the carrying value of the bond, and that's what we're gonna pay as the liability. So I'll show you how that works. Okay, so this is extremely important. You will be asked to make one of these on the final. This is an effective interest amortization schedule. So this is the only way to really keep track of the balance without screwing yourself up. So this is just a schedule of all of the payments that the company will be making, and it shows the unwinding of the discount, okay? So what happens is on the issuance date, January 1st, 2014, the carrying amount is 88,530, and the discount is 11,470, right? And the total, is 100K, right? Our first journal entry, this is the same as this, okay? Remember, we calculate 6% of the face value, of the carrying value. So this interest expense is 6% times the carrying amount, times this here. We're actually making an interest payment in cash of five grand, and therefore the discount is amortizing by 312. The unamortized discount is now, so it goes from 11,470 minus 312 to 11,158. The carrying amount is now 100 grand minus 11,158, 88,842. This same logic applies for each coupon payment. But notice how the interest expense increases a little bit every time. Why is that? Because interest compounds. Remember how um, on your bank account, when you get paid interest, the bank account balance increases, and therefore the interest you receive next year is a little bit higher. The same goes for the interest expense owed by the company. The carrying amount has increased a little bit because our discount has decreased, and therefore the interest expense at 6% will increase just a little bit, okay? Notice how the coupon doesn't change. Remember the coupon is stated contractually. We owe $5,000 every six months, that doesn't change. Notice how the interest expense increases every coupon payment. No, this schedule goes for 10 years, okay? They haven't shown it all for brevity, but the logic is the same at each period. The discount amortization increases a little bit every period. 
Look at what's happening to the unamortized discount. It's declining. Notice how the last day, December 31st, 2023, the total discount amortization that we've booked throughout the 10 years is 11,470, which is this number here. Notice how the unamortized discount is zero. And notice how the carrying amount is 100,000. The schedule will always work out this way. This is not a coincidence. If the math was done right originally, your schedule will always reconcile such that at the end of the maturity, at, at the end of the life of the bond at maturity, the carrying amount will be equivalent to the face. The total amortized discount will be equivalent to the original discount and the unamortized discount will be zero. And the reason we do this is because when we make the They're not showing it here. When we make this payment on December 31st, 2023, to pay this, to pay the bond, the entry is simply debit bonds payable, 100K, credit cash, 100K. It's a very easy entry to close out. But the important thing here is every year, the carrying amount of the bond is going to increase a little bit, right? It's increasing slowly to get to 100,000. So as I said, you will need to make one of these. 100% chance. Okay. The good thing about them is once you know the process for one year, the rest is all the same. I won't ask you to do 10 years because it's too many entries. I might do a three or four year. Okay. You will always, you should always work out such that the carrying amount is equivalent to the face value, as I said. If you don't, you know something's wrong with your calculation. Okay, in a similar vein, what is a zero coupon bond? So a zero coupon bond is similar to the bonds we've looked at, except they don't actually pay um, interest every six months. It's just like a long-term loan. It's I buy the bond today, in 10 years I get paid the face value. As an investor, you still need your 12% rate of return, right? So this is actually a really simple example. The issue price of the bonds is just the present value of the principal. The present value of the principal we know is just a single sum or single payment. Right? That would be your first PV table. So we've looked at bonds issued at a discount. Okay. The flip side is bonds issued at a premium. There is actually nothing different about this calculation. Except in this case, BNSF is overcompensating people. They're issuing a 100 grand bond, stated rate of 10%. This is a coupon. Bonds mature in 10 years, but the market rate, and semi-annual, the market rate is 8%. So if you were to go anywhere else, you would have to pay $100,000 to get 8%. In this case, you're paying $100,000 to get 10%. That's a great deal. Everybody's going to bid for this, right? Everyone's going to want to buy it. So this bond is issued at a premium. If you go to your table here, and actually here, let me go back now, now that I've explained this, to the little, to the example table. But this is sort of a guide. So this is a guide as to how to interpret a bond price. And is it a discounted premium? based on the interest rate. If the stated rate or the coupon is below the market rate, you're gonna have a bond discount. If the stated rate is above the market rate, you're gonna have a premium. If the stated rate is equivalent to the market rate, then the bond price is just equivalent to the face value, the par value, and there's no difference. So you can memorize that, but if you're able to think through why is there a discount or a premium? It'll help you much more when you're trying to solve the problem, right? 
So the bond premium. So let's work through. It's the exact same example. The first step, anytime you see that you have to calculate the issue price of a bond, it's a two-step process. The first is you need the present value of the principal. Okay, and principal is always just a single sum, except in this case, your market rate is only 4%. Okay, your number of periods is the same, 45. Notice how this is higher than um, what we saw in the discount example. In the discount example, this was like 30 something, right? Here it's 45 grand. That makes sense. You have to, you have to start from a higher number if you want to end at 100,000 if you're only compounding at 4% per year. Before you were compound, or 8% uh, per year. Before you were compounding at 12% per year. So you need to invest less because the interest will take care of that for you, right? So nothing different here. We go to the present value table. We see a factor of 0.4564, which is 4%, which is 8% divided by 2 for interest. And our N is 10 times 2. Okay. Don't go the other way. Do not do I times 2 and N divided by 2. Because it's not a 16% rate of interest with, a, with, a, with 5 periods. That will get you a different number. You will always apply this adjustment where you have semi-annual, which makes sense, right? Think about it. If you're getting 8% per year, that's 4% every half year. And how many half-year periods do you have? Well, 10 years... 20 half-year periods, because there's two half-year periods per year. All right, so we calculated the present value of the face. We have the annuity. So remember that the coupon is actually the same, right, as in the previous example. It's a 10% coupon. But again, the market rate is different. So that's going to impact the annuity factor. Okay. And therefore, the PV of your annuity is 67. Notice how the total here is 113,592. That's way over the face value. Before, we were 88,000 relative to 100. Now, we're 113,000 relative to 100. These bonds are said to be issued at a premium, which makes sense, right? Investors are willing to pay more because these bonds pay above the market rate of interest. And if you invest in this... At 113, you are still earning a 8% rate of return. The same way you could invest in a $100,000 bond and get the 8% rate of return. Okay. So how does this journal entry look? It's the exact same. You're getting 113 of cash. The bond payable is recorded at the face value, but you have this credit as opposed to a debit to the premium on bonds payable. And that makes sense because your entry has to balance, right? You can't have debit cash 113, credit bond payable 100. The plug has to go somewhere. But again, the premium steps down over the life of the asset. In this case, notice how the interest expense is below the interest payment. In the previous discount example, the interest expense was always over 5,000. In this case, the interest expense, which is 4% of your carrying amount is always below the interest payment of 5% of face. But notice what happens. We start off, okay, this is equivalent to 100,000. If you subtract the premium from the carrying amount, you get to 100,000, which will be the same as this, right? Your first payment. We're actually, cash is leaving the company of 5,000, okay? But the interest expense is only 4544. The difference is the amortization of the premium. So how does that entry look? Debit, interest expense. Debit, bond premium. Credit, cash. Interest expense is 4544. Debit to the bond premium is 456, credit cash of 5,000. Notice how this premium is calculated, or the, the amortization of the premium and discount is calculated as the difference between these two items. 
it's always a difference between the cash paid, the interest expense, and the, uh, be, between the, the coupon and the interest expense. Okay, you, you can't really calculate this number directly. You have to calculate the interest expense first, and then you subtract it from the interest payment. Make sure that your premium is not increasing as you run the schedule, right? The premium amortizes, it declines over time. You would expect to see, you expect to see the, um, the carrying amount of the bond approach its face value, whether that means increasing or decreasing, right? Because you're starting from a high number, you have to, the, you would expect the carrying value to decline over time to reach the face value at, at the uh, final period. Notice here, 13,592. It's the same as that. Notice how there's no un unamortized premium remaining. Here's that journal entry that I just made. The times interest earned ratio, this is just a measure of um, if the company can meet its, um, its interest obligations. Because again, you're concerned as an investor that the company has too much debt and can't make its interest payments. So this just measures, if you take its net earnings and you add back the interest expense and the income tax expense, how many times you're able to pay your interest expense? A high ratio is more favorable than a low ratio. Right, because it means you have, you're effectively generating more profit with which to pay your interest. Debt to equity, have we seen this before? Debt to equity ratio? So this is a way to look at capital structure, but now you have a much better understanding of why investors care about how much debt there is, right? If there is a very, very high, if there's $100 of liability and of, uh, of debt and $20 of shareholders equity, that's a 500% debt to equity ratio, or five times. That's really high. In this case, BCE is about one to one, right? Not bad. You as an investor, if you're the shareholder, you might be worried about them having a lot of debt because they might go bankrupt. Nothing new here. Issuance of bonds is the cash inflow. Repayment of bond principal at maturity is the cash outflow. And the payment of interest under IFRS is considered the operating activity. Whereas these are financing because these are related to the principal. Okay, so we talked about two methods of interest. The effective interest method is required by IFRS. In some cases, you can use, so ASPE is accounting standards for private enterprises. It's used in Canada for private businesses. But we can use the straight line method. It's much simpler. If we go back to that example whereby the bonds were issued at a discount of 11,470, instead of having to run that complicated schedule, all we do is say that 11,470 discount has to unwind over 20 periods which is $574 per period. So how would our schedule look? Let me show you the schedule here. The discount amortization is the same for every period, and so is the interest expense. We end up with the same number, but we, in some years we're gonna overstate the carrying amount of the bond, and in other years we're gonna understate the carrying amount of the bond. Here's the, the journal entry. The journal entry is the same under either method. The method just determines the calculation of that. Now notice how in this case, the interest expense is actually the calculated number. Because you work backwards and calculate this discount amortization as 11,470 divided by 20 equals 574. And you know that the interest expense is therefore going to be the interest payment plus the discount amortization, because this is a credit, right? Credit, credit, debit. Same goes for the premium. 
Again, the substance really hasn't changed, but all you're doing is you're saying this unamortized premium of 13,592 works out to straight line 680 per period. You know you're, you're crediting by 580, uh, by five, five grand for the coupon, and therefore in, you're debiting that, so you're, you're debiting the premium amortization, so the debit plug is the interest expense, which is the same every period. Again, gets you to the same number, it's just you don't need to take the carrying amount times the market rate of interest to get to the interest expense and then calculate the premium amortization. So that's it for chapter 11. Uh, if you guys want to hang around, I will do uh, a couple of problems. Uh, if not, you're, uh, you're free to go. Thanks.